Good evening and welcome to the Shrewsbury Historical Society. This is our April 2021 presentation. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We have a wonderful speaker planned. Next is our curator's report. Christine Gustafson will report. I'm Chris Gustafson, Vice President. Curator Linda Davis reported about recent inquiries, including one from the schools about local history and several others regarding our programs. We're in the process of converting some old slides and VHS tapes into a digital format, which will be more useful in the future. The board agreed to loan artifacts to the Congregational Church for the 300th anniversary. Okay, thank you. Next is our church <clears throat> report and Christine Gustafson will report on that also. Treasurer Ann Folan reported that our expenses have been paid, including ADT, electric, internet, and the monthly program fee. We also received a donation from Chief Joseph consisting of inspirational materials, a thank you note for our programs on Shrewsbury Media Connection, and a generous donation to the society. We're very appreciative of his kindness. The 2021-2022 budget is also being prepared for the <clears throat> annual report. Finally, as part of the outreach to the community, the Shrewsbury Historical Society awards two scholarships. The Shrewsbury Historical Society Stephen Porter Scholarship is awarded in memory of Stephen Porter, a longtime member who is actively involved in the restoration of the District No. 5 schoolhouse. This scholarship was awarded to Holly Wiscosi. The Shrewsbury Historical Society Jean McDonald Graham Scholarship is awarded in memory of Jean McDonald Graham, a longtime member who was dedicated to educating students about local history. This scholarship was awarded to Ella Callagher Maiori. Congratulations, Holly and Ella. Okay, thank you. Next is our program tonight, <clears throat> Covered Bridges of Central Mass by Bill Caswell. Let me tell you something about the presenter. Bill Caswell is a native of Narragansett, Rhode Island and earned a Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Rhode Island. Since college, he has been employed as a civil engineer at the New Hampshire Department of Transportation. Being new to New Hampshire, Caswell's first supervisor at NHDOT suggested visiting the state's covered bridges. His, the craftsmanship of those structures combined with his lifelong interest in history set his future on a new path. Since 1984, he and his wife have visited most of the standing covered bridges in the United States and Canada. In 2002, he co-founded a research project to document the past and present covered bridges of the United States and Canada. Um, the presentation tonight will give some background of the National Society of the Preservation of Covered Bridges and general information about covered bridges. Bill? Okay, well, thank you all for this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Let me just get the uh, slideshow started here. The Cover Spans of Yesteryear project um, that I and a couple others co-founded uh, has most of the material that's used in this presentation. Uh, we've started that project. You know, come on, move slide. Started that project in 2002 and with the intent of documenting all the covered wooden truss bridges in the United States and Canada. Uh, we found that there was plenty of information available on existing covered bridges, but not so much on the ones that uh, had been lost over time. So we decided we would set out to start researching those bridges and gathering information from various historical societies and so on. So far to date, we've documented over 14,000 covered bridges throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, Ohio by far had the most with nearly 4,500 we've gotten so far. Uh, with Pennsylvania being quite a distant second at uh, 2100 and some. You can see down near the bottom of the list there with Massachusetts, so far we've identified 278 covered bridge locations within the state of Massachusetts. Now our goal with this project is to create a page similar to this for every one of those 14,000 covered bridges where we have some statistical information on the left there some photos on the right to help identify the bridge and, and give you a feel for the area. Some historical comments and notes along with that to give you a little background information because every bridge has a story. We just don't know most of those stories yet. And most importantly to us, the sources of that information. So if anyone who's doing research 
on the bridges of a particular area or over a particular river, uh, wanted to go back and find some additional information, they have our sources as a place to start. Now, as we're going through this project, uh, and I'm sure many of you over time have uh, received a, a photo album from a, uh, an elderly relative and found that most of the photos weren't identified to who they were and realized just how frustrating that is. Well, we're same with us. We receive boxes of cover bridge photos from collections of people who have passed on. Sometimes they're identified, sometimes they're not, but even worse, sometimes they're misidentified, which sends us on a wild goose chase, um, assuming a bridge is a certain location when later to find out it isn't. Now, this is a little more obvious example, but this is the Swift River Bridge in Conway, New Hampshire, which you could go and visit today. And it's there, it's fairly recognizable within the state of New Hampshire. However, if you weren't familiar with covered bridges and you received this postcard saying greetings from Ohio with that picture, that bridge pictured on the bottom, you might be misled to thinking that's actually in Ohio. In fact, the bridge on the top of that card is also in New Hampshire. Well, it's no longer, it was uh, lost to arson in the 1970s, but the two of them have traveled far and wide across the country and show up on numerous postcards from different areas. So this, this is just kind of a humorous example for that one, but we often receive um, pictures where a bridge will be identified a certain way. And, and to us, it's the only photo we know of of that particular bridge. So we don't have anything else to compare it to, to realize whether or not that description is accurate. So the next question, what is a covered bridge? Um, Definitions of that will vary from person to person and depending on your background, but just for the sake of this presentation and the, the statistics that I'm offering, uh, we're going as a bridge supported primarily by the wooden or mostly wooden truss used for vehicle traffic, whether that be the horse and buggies, uh, cars, trains, or boats, et cetera, as opposed to a, a steel or a concrete structure that someone has just built a housing over um, as a covering. It's that the important part there is that it's supported by the wooden truss. Now today we tend to look back at covered bridges as in kind of a nostalgic way or uh, even a romantic way or you know it's a nice little idyllic scene uh, in a countryside. But a hundred years ago people weren't thinking of covered bridges quite the same way. Take, for example, this clipping from the Naugatuck, Connecticut Daily News of May 12th, 1900, which says it would be a big improvement to the town if that old covered bridge were torn down and replaced with an iron bridge. It is true that such an improvement would be quite expensive, but it would be worth more than it would cost. The days of covered bridges with the disease breeding germs that accumulate in them have uh, passed and Beacon Falls would take a step in the right direction by doing away with that old wooden structure and putting up a more modern bridge. Three weeks later in the same paper, it wouldn't be a bad idea to give the roadway of the covered bridge another cleaning. The stench that arose from waste matter here Friday was enough to make a person feel sick. Why not take off the cover or better still build a new bridge without a cover? A new iron bridge in place of that old covered bridge would be an ornament to the town that would be worth all it would cost. Now, unfortunately for this newspaper editor, the covered bridge at Beacon Falls, Connecticut would stand for 35 more years. So he, he certainly didn't get his way in 1900. As we've been documenting the bridges, we're keeping track of how they've been lost over time. And um, when comparing all the records that we have so far, and granted that in many of the cases, we don't know why a covered bridge was lost, but for the ones we do, about 60% of them are just uh, have been replaced or removed or what we consider progress. Uh, at some point in time, someone determined that the bridge wasn't capable of carrying the traffic, uh, wasn't wide enough, wasn't high enough, wasn't sturdy enough, and it was just replaced by something new and better. So that over the whole period of history that we've been researching, that accounts for about 60% of the structures. Another 17% of them have been lost to flooding. Um, as far as natural causes go, and then we have 8% for burned. Um, losing covered bridges to fire, particularly railroad covered bridges was somewhat common uh, back in the olden days. Uh, when railroad bridges were made out of wood, they would have issues with sparks or embers coming out of the trains. 
that would land on a pile of debris or other uh, leaves, dried leaves, whatever, and that would start a fire that would end up burning down the bridge. <clears throat> now, if we narrow this down to just the last 30 years, we can see there's been a change. Obviously, there have been um, historic preservation. There's a lot more, uh, lot more going on now, um, a lot more interest in that. So the replace and remove parts down to about 16%. There's still a number of bridges which have deteriorated to the point where um, by the time someone finally has the funding or the ability to repair them, they realize that they're just too far gone to restore. And there've been a number of instances where those bridges have actually been replaced by new covered bridges, just because the communities feel that they want to uh, maintain a, or retain a covered bridge in their community. Now, the big chunk of the pie that you may have noticed is that arson. Um, a quarter of the covered bridges lost in the last 30 years have been arson. And that's the, the most common cause of losses nowadays. The, flood, <clears throat> the flooding, floods still take their 16% their share. Um, we still have uh, Hurricane Irene that went through in 2011, uh, took out four bridges and, and some of the other storms over the years. Have done the same, so that, that still that still happens. The most recent loss we had was an arson. It was the Beach Fork Bridge in Washington County, Kentucky, uh, just this past March, just a month and a half ago. And uh, at the time of its loss, it was the longest covered bridge remaining in, in Kentucky. Uh, there were only a dozen covered bridges left in the state, and now there are only eleven. Uh, this is some scenes afterwards. <clears throat> now, as far as my other hat, the National Society for the Preservation of Covered Bridges was initially founded in 1950 just as a um, just as a group of people who like to get together and share photographs and stories about their covered bridge excursions into Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, it was based out of Boston at the time. But then in 1952, they got involved with a local campaign to save the Taft Bridge in West Emerson, Vermont. The Vermont Department of Transportation had intended to replace the bridge as part of a highway improvement project, and the local people in West Emerson didn't want it to didn't want to see it go. And what ultimately happened is that bridge was dismantled and relocated to Sturbridge Village, so where it still stands today. After that bit of success, um, the group got a little more serious about their uh, their their organization. And they started transitioning from just a, a social gathering to actually, you know, we can do this. You know, we can put more effort into preserving these covered bridges rather than just going and visiting them. Two years later, on August 9th of 1954, uh, the society was officially incorporated in Boston. So on to Massachusetts bridges. As I mentioned earlier, we've identified nearly 300 cover bridge locations throughout the state. Almost a third of those bridges were railroad covered bridges. And in the grander scheme um, beyond Massachusetts, through as far as nationwide goes, it's statistic is pretty much the same. It's still about a third of the cover bridges we have documented were railroad bridges. Uh, there are 10 still standing that fit that definition I had mentioned earlier. Only two of those are still 19th century bridges. Uh, the others are ones that have been built uh, since then in the last century. If we look at a map of the state with all the bridges we have documented so far, the tan squares are the bridges that have been lost over time and the red circles are the ones that are still standing. <clears throat> now I find it, when I look at this map, I find it kind of interesting to note that those bridges tend to follow the the travel patterns that we still have today uh, along the US 20 route in the southern part of the state, along Route 2 in the northern part of the state, uh, right up the Connecticut River Valley. And you'll notice that particularly in the northwest corner in the hill towns of the northwest was a particularly heavy concentration of covered bridges um, back a century ago. If we look at just the standing covered bridges and focus a little more on the central part of the state, uh, you can see down in the lower part on the bottom of that map is the the, the Vermont or the Dumberston Bridge um, in Sturbridge Village. The next nearest one to Shrewsbury is off to the west, uh, the Gilbertville Bridge. 
the Gilbertville Bridge was built in 1886 um, by the, uh, the towns of Hardwick and Ware. And they both shared the costs to construct that. Of course, these were the days before there was a, a Department of Transportation and Federal Highway Administration to fund those projects. So they uh, were funded by the individual communities at the time. The bridge was closed uh, 100 years later, and it probably had some repairs over time along the way as well. But it was closed in 1986 for repairs. Uh, the repairs were done. The bridge was reopened. In 2002, it was closed again for a much longer period of time, as it was at the time they were having difficulty raising funds to do the repairs on that. And it wasn't reopened again until 2011. Now this particular bridge has been kind of interesting in the past where uh, during the time when it was maintained by the two towns, uh, they weren't always uh, in sync with their repair work or uh, their maintenance of the bridge. So there have been a number of pictures over time showing this bridge with half in need of repair and half not in too bad condition. So it's, this photo was uh, in the society's collection from 1948. And the next one, even nine years earlier, 1939, it still had that, that same look with the part in one town is, looks like it's in decent shape. The part in the other town needs some attention. Now, when we identify covered bridges, we tend to uh, document them by their trust design. That's just one way with it. We organize and categorize them. And the Gilbertville Bridge is an example of the town trust, which was developed by the architect Ithiel Town of New Haven, Connecticut. And Mr. Town patented this trust in 1820. And although he didn't actually build too many covered bridges, he, he only built a handful of them while he was still working on the design of the trust. Uh, he sold the rights to his patent to uh, individuals all over the country. He would, uh, they would send their information to him about how long a bridge they needed, where they were going to put it, and so on. He would draw up the designs and sell the designs to them. He became very rich in, in doing that. And the uh, town trusses were one of the two most common covered bridge types. Whereas today, a quarter of the standing covered bridges uh, use this design. Now the, the town truss is identified by the, the crisscross pattern of those timbers along the way that lattice kind of look. And they're uh, pegged together with wooden pegs called trunnels. <clears throat> and that's how, how you can identify the, the town trusses. And Ithiel Town developed this as with the intent of creating a, a simpler design than some of the other designs that were available. Uh, the other one, which we'll see next, the Burr Trust was complicated to build and required people with the specialized knowledge of constructing these covered bridges to be able to construct it properly. So town decided that if you could come up with a design that was that could be built by any decent carpenter, um, it would be a lot better for communities because they wouldn't have to pay these specialists to come into their town, pay for their lodging and so on during the time to construct the bridge. They could just hire, hire uh, the local barn builder person and, and find a sawmill, and they would be able to construct their own bridges with their local people. And that's typically what happened with the town trusses, and that's how Mr. Town got to be very rich in his home in New Haven. So as I mentioned, the Burr Trust was the other um, popular option at the time. And between these two, they're pretty much equal numbers today as far as numbers standing. <clears throat> but between the two of them, they do account for half of the cover bridges in the United States and Canada, where overall in the uh, 19th century, there were a little over two dozen different cover bridge designs available. So, but these two were far, by far the, uh, the most popular. The Bird Trust example on the bottom there is from the Arthur Smith Bridge in Coleraine. And Theodore Burr was also from Connecticut and his design took a much older uh, wooden truss design called a multiple king post design. And then he added that uh, large arch to it to help share some of the load. Now the multiple king post design, really what that is, is the, the vertical posts that you see in there are what are called the king posts. And the diagonal braces that are connected to them will um, move that load from the center of the bridge towards the outside. And that's really how every covered bridge truss works. It's, it's a different method of um, getting that 
load, the weight of the vehicles, the weight of the structure itself moved outward towards the abutments where the support system is. <clears throat> so what would happen is you have the weight of the roadway that's pulling down on that king post truss, the vertical truss, which is uh, connected to the roadway. And then the diagonal braces are notched into the top of one and the load is transferred through that notch connection diagonally down and outward towards the abutment to the bottom of the next post, where again, it puts um, weight, puts tension on, on that next post, which transfers the load upward into the next diagonal and so on outward until you've gotten all the way to the abutment. Now, the tricky part of building the Burr truss uh, was getting that arch to work well in unison with the truss part. Uh, a lot of times what would happen is that if the bridge wasn't constructed just right and either the truss or the arch was taking too much of the load, one of them's going to buckle and it's going to bring the other one down. Uh, we've seen some great pictures of bridges where the arches have just completely collapsed because they were overburdened and the truss part wasn't taking enough of the weight of the bridge. Now, the Smith Bridge uh, that we see today was built in 2006. It has kind of a long history at this site, but the uh, prior, it replaced a historic bridge at that location, which was built in 1870. Now the bridge wasn't actually built there. In fact, it was built a little bit downstream uh, in 1870. And you'll find that uh, throughout New Hampshire, Vermont and Massachusetts, uh, 1870 is a fairly common construction date for covered bridges. And the reason for that is because there was a significant flood in October of 1869, which did a lot of destruction throughout the three states. <clears throat> so a lot of these bridges built in 1870 were actually replacements for bridges, uh, some covered, some not, that were lost during flooding in October of 1869. But this particular bridge, uh, the, the historic Smith Bridge, was built in 1870, further downstream from the location where the present bridge is in Colerain. And in 1878, it suffered some damage from a flood and the bridge ended up being closed. A few years later, the town actually closed and abandoned the road that the bridge was on and it sat there unused for a number of years. The story goes that either in 1895 or 96, um, a, a herd of Arthur Smith's cattle were crossing the bridge that was at this location and caused the bridge to collapse. The, Town fathers, being the, the frugal New Englanders that they were, knew that they had this other uh, cover bridge that wasn't serving any purpose, that was just not too far away. So they dismantled that bridge and they reassembled it at the location of the lost bridge at this site. And that's where that bridge stood until um, it was ultimately replaced in 2006. Now that the historic Arthur Smith Bridge uh, over time deteriorated, needed repairs. Unfortunately, funding wasn't available for repairs. Uh, the bridge was closed in 1981 over safety concerns, still awaiting funding for repairs. Uh, that didn't happen. By 1991, 10 years later, they were really concerned that the bridge was just going to collapse into the river. So it was moved off onto dry land where it sat for another 15 years. By the time the money was finally available to do the repair work, they found that the bridge had been so badly deteriorated by, by, by not being used, by uh, having some of the covering missing, so water was getting into the truss and deteriorating even further. Uh, they found that it was so bad that only a few token parts from this bridge were able to be used for the new one. So the, the new bridge is almost entirely a new bridge. There are a few pieces were uh, reused from the old one, but for the most part, it's all new. Colerain used to be a, a rather popular spot for covered bridges, as were many of the hill towns in the northwest part of the state. Uh, this one, at the Adamsville Bridge. Adamsville used to be a community uh, with a large hotel, uh, a blacksmith shop, mill, school, and so on. Um, but that community is, is gone now. This particular bridge was lost during the flooding in March of 1936, uh, another significant flood that that took out lots of covered bridges, lots of bridges, lots of farms, lots of homes uh, throughout the New England area. 
Another one in Coleraine was called the Upper Lionsville Bridge. This one was lost during the hurricane in September 1938. So New England was really battered uh, over those couple of years uh, between the, the really bad spring flooding in March of 36, followed by the hurricane in September of 38. Uh, there was a lot of destruction that went on uh, in that two and a half year period. Another in Coleraine was the Elm Grove Bridge, uh, which was also lost in the, the uh, 1938 hurricane. And the Smith Bridge was the, well, still is the, the last bridge in, in town. One of the survivors of that September 38 hurricane was the Conway uh, bridge, also known as the Burkeville Bridge, which is still standing today. This is a picture of it after the hurricane, when it did need to be closed for some repairs. So it was closed for a year or so, maybe, uh, until repairs were made and the bridge was reopened to traffic. The bridge stood for quite a while until 1983, when it was considered unsafe and, and closed to traffic again. At that point, there were lots of delays, uh, like some of the others, uh, funding delays. Uh, there was a point around 2000 where a contractor was hired and the contractor didn't work out, uh, ended up not finishing the project. Finally, in 2005, the bridge was, was finally uh, reconstructed. Uh, at that time, it wasn't reopened to traffic though. Uh, the state DOT decided that uh, the bridge couldn't be safely open to traffic because it didn't have appropriate bridge guardrails and then some other reasons. Uh, but they basically told the, the town of Conway that even though your bridge is certainly um, ready for traffic, it can handle traffic weight wise and all uh, for safety reasons, they were choosing not to allow them to open it. This continued on with a long standing discussion that came up year after year until finally in 2013, uh, the DOT said, fine, it's your decision. You can choose to open it to traffic if you wish. So on November 17th of 2013, this bridge was open to traffic for the first time in 30 years. And you can still drive through it today. And there's always that nice photograph there with the church in the background. And it's just a beautiful place to go. And it is built in 1870. It's the oldest covered bridge in Massachusetts, where I had mentioned that there were two um, two 19th century bridges in the state. It was this one in Gilbertville was the other one, the first one I showed. Now the Conway Bridge also uses a different type of truss uh, than the other two that we've seen so far. This one was called a Howe Truss and William Howe was um, from Massachusetts, uh, lived in Massachusetts and his truss uses iron rods or originally iron, now steel rods for the vertical parts where the other trusses were uh, wooden. And he found that to be stronger and it got to be a very popular design, but more on that later. Similar to the, the bird truss I showed before, there are also those diagonal braces uh, that help transfer the load from the center of the bridge outward towards the outside. Now this one's a little bit unusual as far as how trusses go, uh, especially in the Eastern states. Usually in how trusses in the east, there's um, what's called a counter brace, which runs in the, uh, diagonally in the opposite direction. So it really looks more like each panel has an X uh, as you're going along through the bridge. This particular design is uh, more commonly found in the Western states, particularly in Oregon. Uh, how trusses in Oregon look very much like this. So I'm not quite sure why this particular bridge has more of a Western design than the Eastern design, but it, but it does. As I mentioned, William Howe was born in 1803 in Spencer, Massachusetts. And as a young engineer, he saw the Boston and Albany Railroad being built uh, in through his area. And he was seeing the long trusses that they were using at the time. The long truss was considered the first, um, first truss developed by an engineer, whereas the prior ones had been all developed by architects. It was developed by Colonel Stephen Long of the US Army Corps of Engineers who had a quite an illustrious career um, building railroads out to the West, expanding railroads to the Western states. Uh, he built one of the first covered, uh, covered for one of the first iron bridges over the Mississippi River in 
so on. But he also developed this uh, trust design in his earlier years. William Howe saw that and, and thought he could improve on the design. And he did just that, basically just replacing the, the wooden vertical timbers with iron at the time and later on steel. Uh, he made trusses significantly popular. And the, the Howe Trust was an instant hit with the railroads. Uh, they needed obviously uh, uh, sturdy, heavier bridges to carry their loads, to carry the engines, to carry the freight. And freight trains were constantly getting larger and heavier and they needed the sturdier bridge. So the Howe Trust became the most common design for railroad covered bridges almost instantly after it was built. And the map you see in the background um, from my setting here is, is the map of Warren, Massachusetts where Howe's first bridge was built. Now on this map, this is actually showing a later version of the uh, a later covered bridge built at that location, not Howe's original bridge. Now, originally that was a single track line. And then after a few years, <clears throat> uh, the railroad expanded to a double track design. So trains would be able to travel in both directions through this area. And here's a photograph we have of the, of the later bridge. But the first one was built in 1838 and it was Howe's first design he ended up patenting his design a couple of years later. Now I'd mentioned the, the long trusses and as you look at the design sketches over on the right, you can see that they're essentially the, the same design. Uh, the only difference being in the long truss, the vertical posts are made of wood In the how design they're made of iron and later on steel. <clears throat> So an example of the long truss that you can see today is the Bissell Bridge in Charlemont. Uh, and it does have the, the complete X there where it has the, uh, the heavier diagonal brace, which goes down and outward. And then the lighter counter brace, which is really just to help kind of keep the whole thing square and just stiffen the truss a little bit more, but usually made of lighter timbers running in the opposite direction. The Bissell Bridge was built in 1951 to replace an earlier cover bridge at that location. And it was constructed at a cost of just under $55,000 in, <clears throat> in 1951. Uh, the bridge had been closed in 1995 and the state had in, intended to replace at that time. And the local townspeople didn't, didn't wanna have any of that. Uh, they were determined that they were gonna keep their cover bridge. It took a lot of convincing, but finally in the, the spring of 2009, the bridge was repaired and back up to roadway standards and reopened again. So it, it took them 20 years. Yeah, well, it took them 14 years, but eventually the, the townspeople did win out over the state DOT as far as getting that bridge repaired and keeping a covered bridge in their community. <clears throat> this is the bridge that it replaced. Uh, it was originally built, well, at the uh, March 1880 town meeting, it was voted to construct this bridge near Adam Bissell's house, which is where the bridge got its name from. At the time, the bridge cost $600 to construct. And it was built at the same time as an ore, an ore mine nearby opened up. So a lot of its traffic were, were the ore wagons transporting materials back and forth to that mine. So the bridge was condemned in the late 1940s, closed for a few years, and then, as you saw, uh, replaced in 1951 with a, a much larger, more substantial bridge. Now, if we try to narrow into the Shrewsbury area a little bit tighter, um, we find that the, there really haven't been too many cover bridges in that area. And the ones that were there were primarily railroad bridges. And railroad bridges are notor notoriously difficult to find information or photographs of. They were often in remote locations rather than being in the center of a village and um, people weren't in a position to be able to photograph them. It's not like you know, you're driving along the road, you see the cover bridge, you stop and take a picture. The railroad cover bridges would be out in the woods, off the road, off the beaten path. So there aren't pictures of many of them. Also, since they were built by the railroads and the railroads are private companies, we're not finding information about construction or repair of the bridges in public records. So the, you know, if you're looking through uh, a lot of the information we do find comes from 
historical societies, town records, and so on. But you're not going to find any information about the railroad bridges in those sources because they were just built by the railroads. And unless the railroad records happen to be available, uh, your chances of finding information are fairly slim. Now, there were some uh, every year, the railroad commissioners would make a report to the state on the status of the lines within that state. Sometimes that didn't have much more than, um, you know, we have 500 miles of track and it's all in good condition. And sometimes they would be very detailed reports, which would list the various types of bridges that are on the line uh, and mention specifically any ones that had been repaired during the course of that year. So sometimes we get lucky, but it's really hit or miss. One of the bridges that we do have a little bit of information on, uh, it's kind of to the uh, Northwest in Barrie is the cemetery bridge. The cemetery bridge, uh, according to uh, an agreement in the Barrie Historical Society dated August 17th of 1847, uh, where the town had contracted with a couple builders to have a bridge completed um, by October of 1848. The bridge was to be 60 feet long and built of good quality materials and put together in a workmanlike manner, so it said. Uh, apparently the bridge was uh, done pretty well because it lasted for almost 100 years until the September 1938 hurricane carried it about 100 yards downstream, deposited it in a field and in a somewhat wrecked condition. The bridge, um, apparently the town felt couldn't be salvaged, so it was dismantled and scrapped at that point. And no bridge was ever reconstructed at that site. That, that location on Cemetery Road, to the best of my knowledge, is, is, just has its vacant abutments there from 1938. Another kind of interesting bridge in, in the same town there uh, was this red bridge. And this is what we call a pony truss bridge. <clears throat> it didn't actually have a roof and it was, it, they're referred to as pony trusses because the walls are only about half the height of a normal wall. And the truss, there's still a truss design under there. And the truss is completely boarded on both sides, inside and out for the covering. So these are, are much more rare than the cover bridges we see today. There are only a couple of these pony trusses left uh, nationwide, one of them being in Wilton, New Hampshire. And there's, there's actually, well, there's actually two in New Hampshire. There's a railroad bridge in New Hampshire up north in Randolph and the uh, the roadway bridge, which is now closed, but still still visible off the side of Route 101 in Wilton. And there's one other one in Pennsylvania somewhere. But anyway, this bridge was also lost in the uh, September 1938 hurricane. Another pony truss bridge in the area that lasted a little bit longer was this bridge in Sterling, Mass, which uh, survived until 1989. And this bridge was likely originally built by the railroad uh, to avoid a road crossing. And these were fairly common, at least throughout the Northeast. And Massachusetts had a couple of them up until the eighties uh, when they were dismantled. New Hampshire still has one left. Uh, there were many others, of course, over the years, which have been uh, replaced either by other bridges or, or the crossings abandoned altogether. But this particular one, like I said, it lasted until 1989 before it was finally replaced. And as, as you, the roadway driver, drive across this, it really doesn't look like much. You know, you, you barely even see the, the walls of the truss coming up above the roadway surface on there. Uh, but it has a much better view from the track with its very simple truss design. Another bridge up in Fitchburg, uh, this particular bridge we don't know when it was built. Uh, we do have a record of it receiving extensive repairs. We don't know exactly what those included, but the note just said extensive repairs in 1901. Uh, then again, by December 1911, apparently the town of Fitchburg was planning to replace this bridge. This photograph was taken in December of 1911. And by December of 1912, uh, the new iron bridge was in place and ded dedication was held on December 31st of 1912. Now, I'd mentioned that the railroad bridges were really hard to uh, gather information on. And while this is one that we're very fortunate that the Harvard Historical Society does have this photograph of a railroad bridge that used to stand in their town. Um, it was in the, the village of Still River until it burned in August of 1899. And just to give you an idea what, you know, what little information we actually find on these bridges, 
this, this is the information we have on this bridge so far. It was this little clipping from the August 16th, 1899 Fitchburg Sentinel, which says the Boston and Maine Railway, Railway Bridge at Still River burned Tuesday night and traffic on that lane, line is delayed today. And that's it. That's all the information we've been able to find on that bridge so far. It's just that one little clipping in the newspaper. <clears throat> now, the fire that's actually a little closer uh, to you guys in Millville, which got significantly more uh, news attention, uh, were actually two railroad cover bridges, which were side by side over the Blackstone River in Millville. The, uh, the two, I don't know which, you know, which one started first, I don't know if it even matters, but both bridges caught fire and they ended up burning. Uh, the news article also mentions that there was a, an iron highway bridge nearby, or steel bridge rather, high, nearby that the firemen were able to save, which, you know, no real surprise, the steel bridge wasn't going to burn. But nonetheless, this is, um, I found out about this bridge initially from one of those railroad commissioner's reports. And ironically, it was actually in the Rhode Island commissioner's report where I found the information about this Massachusetts bridge burning. And then I started looking for the newspaper articles and found uh, uh, a few newspaper articles from different papers uh, carrying the story. But that must have been quite a sight to see that to have the, the two cover bridges side by side, both burning and uh, railroads were, were really good about replacing their bridges because of course for them, a bridge out is lost income. So often there would be trestle spans that were rebuilt and the railway back in service within a couple of days uh, while they would build a new bridge often beside the uh, temporary bridge. And then over the course of a day or two, they could slide the new bridge into place. So that was, you know, uh, loss of income is loss of income. So they did whatever they could to keep traffic moving on the rails. <clears throat> the last bridge I'm gonna talk about is one of my favorites within Massachusetts, also within the town of Millville. And just the unusual design of this bridge just has always appealed to me since the first time I saw it. Uh, but this was Bannigan Heights Bridge, and it was in eight, around 1882, Joseph Bannigan um, constructed a rubber mill in the town of Millville. It was actually an extension of the Woonsocket Rubber Company that he, uh, Millville offered him a better deal as far as constructing the mill there instead of building it in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. So he built it across the border into Massachusetts and built this whole community around there because at the time, you know, a, a mill community was a community. So he not only built the mill, he built the houses that his workers lived in. He built a school, there was a playground, there was a ball field. He, basically he built a whole town that focused around this rubber mill. And the bridge was a, a way of um, the workers getting from their homes on one side of the river to the mill that was on the other side. You'll notice on the left in the picture, the, the really tall pedestrian walkway opening, you know, because uh, there was so much pedestrian traffic going back and forth to the factory, he built it so that there was a separate pedestrian lane there so they wouldn't be have to walk in traffic through the bridge. Unfortunately, the mill fell on hard times like so many other businesses during the Great Depression and in 1930, uh, it was gonna close down. Now, this was really unfortunate for the town of Millville because for them, the mill was their industry in town. That, that, that's really all there was to the town uh, as far as business goes. So once the mill finally did close, the town basically went bankrupt because all of a sudden all those workers were suddenly on um, needing public assistance and the town couldn't afford it. They had no more income anymore. They were only uh, doling out money. And there were even at the time, and I, I don't remember exactly what year this newspaper was from. Um, it was sometime in the late 30s where town officials were considering just donating their town to some other nearby town who was willing to take the land and, and just take ownership of what used to be the town of Millville. Uh, of course, nobody was interested because they realized that it was the debt that went with it. Um, but I just found that kind of an interesting little fact. And while well, Millville still survives today, but the factory and its surroundings do not. Uh, the whole area was raised in the 1940s. Uh, as far as I know, all the buildings are gone. The bridge was removed at the same time. Uh, the abutments 
were still remaining later. I don't know if they still exist today or not, but they they did um, last for a while after because we have we have some photos that people have taken of, of the empty abutments after the bridge was uh, demolished. So. As president of the National Society for the Cover Preservation of Covered Bridges, I would be remiss if I didn't do a little plug for the society at the end of my presentation. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about our organization, please visit our website, coveredbridgesociety.org, or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash NSPCB. We have a membership, which is $20 per year. Uh, the membership includes uh, four quarterly copies of both of our publications. We do have two publications. Cover Bridge Topics is mostly uh, historic research and photos from our archives. And our newsletter is more um, recent Cover Bridge news, upcoming events, things like that. So, and you get those come four times a year. We also maintain an archive room in Concord, New Hampshire, which is where a lot of those photographs come. On the left, you'll see the bookshelves where we have a, a quite a collection of cover bridge related books, along with some photo albums and scrapbooks that have been donated to us over the years. On the right are the file cabinets with our photo collection. Uh, the photo collection is, is pretty extensive and uh, one of our members who is now passed spent 10 years going through all the photos, organizing them. So they're all in the file cabinets by uh, state and county, all in their um, archival protectors and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, we're very fortunate to have that space and to be able to, to maintain that space for our collection. <clears throat> we also publish a world guide to cover bridges. Since 1956, there have been seven editions of the book. Uh, the latest one being in 2009. There is a, an eighth edition, which I am working on right now and hope to have published by the end of the year. Knowing that technology is constantly moving forward, we're also working on an online version, um, electronic version of the World Guide to Cover Bridges, uh, which focuses just on the United States and Canadian bridges at this point. Uh, the site isn't completely done yet. There's still some uh, development going on. Uh, that's why the address there, the abhdemo.com. It's, it's not the real website address yet, but that'll, get you in where you can look around and uh, explore, uh, search for bridges by name, by location. Uh, once you select a bridge, it will show you any other bridges within 25 miles. Uh, for society members, there are extra benefits on there where you can do uh, trip routing. So if you wanna go out on a cover bridge tour of your own, uh, you can select a bunch of bridges and it will develop a map um, of the, the best route to those bridges. We're also moving that forward uh, where the website has been pretty well developed and, and is mostly finished. Uh, we're moving that also to a phone app, uh, which is just beginning development now. So it's, it's just in some very early testing phases of uh, just trying to work some bugs out and then do more enhancement on that. So that's, uh, that's coming. Hopefully in another year or so, we'll have the phone app available. We do have meetings, monthly meetings between March and October. Uh, of course, the past year, the, our meetings have been Zoom meetings like most other people. Um, in 2015, my wife and I started organizing cover bridge tours. Uh, we've been doing three day tours in different parts of the country. The photo at the lower right is the latest one we did in uh, July of 2019, it was a three day tour of cover bridges in New Brunswick. And our next one, if all goes well and we're able to pull it off, will be in Western Indiana in mid-September. <clears throat> Lately, uh, we've been, or in 2015, we started a program where we were taking donations that we receive and we have been using them to purchase fire retardant for historic cover bridges. So the photos that you see going on in the slideshow are bridges that we have donated fire retardant to in the past six years. So far, a total of uh, $15,000 has been spent on fire retardant for the, uh, the bridges you see here. And that's a program that we feel is very worthwhile. It's, it's something that we can do that we feel that we're actually helping to uh, preserve the bridges and reduce the, the incidents of arson that are going on. One more. 
the big one in Bridgeport, California. And this bridge in Bridgeport, California is 210 feet long and it's going through an extensive restoration right now, which will be done in about a month or so. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope you found the presentation to be interesting and informative and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Phil. It's been very interesting. Uh, I, I love the old fashioned pictures before and after you can see them. They're, they're really good. Thank it's, you always inter it's always interesting to see how the bridges have changed over time as well, too. Yes, yes. Okay. Our, uh, our May meeting will be May 26, 2021, 18th and early 20th century medicine in Shrewsbury, Doctors in Their Times by Dr. B. Dale McGee. We hope to see you there. Thank you very much.